How are you tonight? Well, we are concluding the uh, series uh, on, on worship fiercely. It'll actually conclude this coming Wednesday, but as far as the weekend services, this is going to be kind of our, our, our wrap up. And, and we're going to be talking today about what public worship should look like. Now, most of us have some kind of exposure to some kind of public worship, and usually we react out of that, whatever our past, bring, what we bring to the table, our past. Some of you might have, uh, in your, when you think of worship, your past was uh, genuflexes and sitting and standing and holding a hymnal book and, you know, might have had certain thing, elements of those kinds of things. And others of you might be dancing and shouting and running around with flags and all day, you know, it's all day Sunday or all day uh, Saturday night or whatever. Others of you might be some conference you attended. So you have all of these kinds of uh, different approaches people bring to worship. And often we either want, like, we want to relive some of that, or we're thinking, I'd never want to have that again. And, and all these things going on, and, uh, and, and, and those affect our perspective of worship. And now beyond our background and our experience, uh, many times our temperament plays a role in that. If you're older, the older we get, studies show we tend to want more order in our lives. And, and the younger we are, the more we're okay with chaos, the more we're okay with disorder. And so th that often plays a role in it. Our temperament, and you know, I remember an aunt <clears throat> that I had when I was growing up, she was very orderly. I mean, she had on her couches that she left the plastic on when she would buy them. And the lamps, you know how they have little plastic, all that was left on. And, and if we, were, we weren't really allowed around the furniture because it had to be kept, you know, dust free, handprint free. You know, some people, they're like that with worship. I mean, they want it incredible, very orderly. And then again, the younger people are, they, they don't tend to be like that. And, and so there's those aspects that go into it. Um, there's, um, there's people's theological viewpoint. Uh, their understanding of scripture will often influence the way they think worship should be. And so you have all of these different things that go on. And, and that can be a challenge for any church that uh, when you gather together people from all these different uh, diverse backgrounds and <clears throat> to come together and worship together. So what we're going to look at is in 1 Corinthians 14. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn open there because there Paul gives some transcultural, tr some principles that go beyond just our, our current culture we live in, uh, our current time frame. And there, it's, it, it be, whether you worship in Italy or in, in, in a country in Africa or somewhere in Asia or in America, they're the same principles. Whether it's 2,000 years ago or today, the same principles. These are the things that go in. And specifically, he's talking about public worship. So we're going to look at that real briefly. And then we're going to spend some time in worship. Okay, so we're looking at these guidelines, and, and I put them in the form of questions, four questions. Number one, is God present in worship? That's an important question. Is the worship spirit-filled? Paul says in verse 1, he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, he's talking about public worship. He's talking about uh, things of worship, and he says that it, there, should be, there should be evidence of the Spirit of God in worship should be spirit-filled. So what, what is, what is spirit-filled worship? What is, how do you know when God is evident in worship? Well, it's not, it's not just because the singers are singing in key or they're harmonizing nicely or the band is really in a tight groove. I mean, those are nice things, but that does not mean God is present in that worship. How do we know God is present in the worship service? Well, I want to tell you. But I'm going to tell you through our friend, Mike. Pastor Mike, I, I've invited him down. He's a vineyard pastor and has been for many, many years. And he's speaking on that tomorrow at 4, from 4 to 6. But I just wanted just to have him come. And Mike, why don't you come on up and just share. I posed him that question. I said, Mike, how do you know when God is present in a worship service? And he's going to share his thoughts on that, okay? I stepped off the plane yesterday, and that was the first question he asked me. Uh, <laughs> So I was totally unprepared, and I've been thinking about it. So I scribbled down a few thoughts, okay? You know, how do I know? Uh, I'm going to talk to you 
from a personal perspective because I think worship is very subjective. What is, what, what, what is your cup of tea might not be my cup of tea. What opens you up to God might not open up, uh, I might not respond to. So um, the mu for me, the music doesn't have to be particularly even good, you know, or the style, my cup of tea, really. Um, there doesn't have to be a big Jesus party going on in the room either for me to know that God is present in a particular worship service. Um, for me, it's when I become more aware of God than the worship band or the other people in the room. Suddenly, I'm more in tune. I'm aware of God being there with me. Um, there's no certain, you know, and this doesn't mean there is a certain mood that I'm in. I might not be the happiest. I might not be the saddest. I might be in a, in a, I might be hurting when I'm coming into the service and not in a particularly receptive mood. But suddenly, it's not that I'm happy, but I'm aware. Get it? And uh, I become aware that I'm, I might become aware that I'm in the, the, uh, the, the, the presence of, a, uh, of God. You know, a, a God who is, is, is majestic, you see, an awesome God. And I become, instead of standing up and cheering and running around, I become still because that's my worship. That's my response to that awareness. And, and, and so it could be that, look like that or feel like that. I become, or I, I might uh, become aware that I'm in the quiet um, uh, 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 presence of a holy God. And suddenly, I'm not clapping my hands, and I'm not cheering, or, uh, but I'm aware of my humanness and my brokenness and my sinfulness. And I'm also aware that I'm in the presence of a loving, gracious, merciful God. And I might just cry quietly, you know. Um, or I, I become aware that suddenly I become aware that I'm in the presence of a God who loves me, and I'm filled with thankfulness. All of a sudden, nothing else matters. I got all these problems at work or at home, but nothing else matters, and I'm filled with thankfulness. And so my response becomes joyful. And then I do clap, and I shout, and I dance, or whatever, you know? Um, I know that God is present in worship when he somehow breaks in and meets me where I am, whether that I'm in a good mood, bad mood, whether I'm hurting, I need some TLC, or I'm just on top of the world, see? And uh, he, you know, whatever mood or condition that I'm in, he's no longer just words in these songs that I'm singing. He, you know, or he's not just a name in a prayer that we're saying together. Uh, he becomes somehow real and present for me in that moment. Okay, boss? I like it. Uh, I like it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mike. Let's, thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. All the way from Brooklyn just to tell us that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that's not an easy question. Because, you know, you hear, <clears throat> if you've been around church a little very long, you hear, oh, that's the, the, the worship wasn't anointed tonight. Well, what does that mean? You know, and is that all on the band? I mean, I mean so I, I like what Mike was talking about where, you know, it's, it's us experiencing the presence of God. <clears throat> and that can look a lot of different ways. Down in verse 25, I like how it's kind of summarized with this statement. He says, he will fall down and worship God exclaiming, God is really among you. I love that. To me, that is a good description <clears throat> of, um, of spirit-anointed worship. When you have this sense, hey, God's here. God's really among us. There's, you know, it's, it's palpable. There's, there's something different. I walked in, and I was just kind of in the humdrum going through life, and all of a sudden, I feel like I've connected with God in a, in a, in a tangible way. <clears throat> Here's another question about public worship. Does the worship build people up? Are people built up? And then here's uh, the text that goes along with that, verses 1 through 5. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit, 
But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strength and encouragement and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. <clears throat> That's kind of a cool phrase, huh? I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. Uh, he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So Paul uses the word building up or edification uh, four times. And then just in, in that part, and then three other times in the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> the Greek word for building up is okidomen. Oki is this word house, uh, and then domen is to build. And so he's using this idea of building this, this public a house of worship, the house of God. And he kind of uses then he, as an example, he gives like these tools. He says one tool would be tongues. The other tool would be prophecy. And he says using the right tool for the right thing. Now, I'm not Mr. Handyman. I'll just be straight up with you. And, but I do like to, I mean, sometimes I'll try to attempt fixing stuff around the house. And, and one time I was fixing some pipes and I didn't have the right wrench. I'm trying to use a, a, a wrench that's way too small. And, and finally, I just couldn't get it. And a friend of mine, he brought over a huge, the, the right wrench, but it was way bigger. Mine was better for like working on somebody's teeth or something, not, not on plumbing. You know, I have this little thing. And, 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 and so using the right, the right tool for the right thing. And he says, now, these are good tools. Both of them are good tools, but they do different things. And tongues versus, proper, versus prophecy is, is kind of like this idea of when it comes to home repair, when it comes to building up, they build up different things. Now, tongues builds up. Verse 4, it says, he who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. But he who prophesies builds up the church. So he says, they're both valuable. One builds up one thing. Another builds up the other. <clears throat> now, the word tongue literally means language. Okay, so it's a language. But a tongue is a language spoken to God. It's, 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 a, it's a spiritual language. That is spoken to God. Verse 14, he says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He says, I don't even understand what I'm praying when I speak in tongues. You say, well, how could that build somebody up if you don't even understand it? Well, that's because understanding the idea that we are not just flesh and blood, that there's a part of us that's spirit. And so it builds up our spirit when we speak in tongues. Now, this tongue that he's talking about is different than the language that was spoken, for example, in Acts 2, because there, <clears throat> they did understand it. But he's talking about here a, a language that the speaker doesn't understand, but is spoken to God, and that it builds up the spirit part of us. He says that, that's a tool. It builds us up. It builds our faith. It, 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 there's a, there's, uh, it, it builds our, our it, it's a form of prayer that we can pray and and, and, and builds our, 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 uh, our, 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 our capacity for spiritual warfare. So it has this building aspect, but it's different than prophecy that builds the church <clears throat> because people can understand the prophecy. So it builds them up. And so one is spoken to God, the other is spoken to people. They're both forms of prayer, and they can both happen in, in, in the worship service. It's part of the worship service. It's verse 14 and 15 Paul says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And then verse 15, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, and I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. So there's, there's this element of, 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 of uh, having this in our worship. He sings, he's singing in the spirit, but he says, make sure that, uh, that uh, want, you use the right tool for the right thing. If you're wanting to build yourself up, your spirit self, then that's where, uh, that's where tongues plays the, uh, a vital role. Prophecy is the other one. He says, unless, of course, there's interpretation to the tongue so that there's understanding. <clears throat> Number three, is worship understandable? So this is an important part that is brought out. This, it's a challenge uh, uh, in worship service that it needs to be understandable. Uh, beginning in verse six, he says, now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring to you some re revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? 
Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue. How will anyone know what you are saying? You are just speaking in the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not speak, uh, do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to a speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that what? <clears throat> Build up the church. This is a, a passage on public worship service. He's saying that, that, that we need, when we're together, these are the things we want to excel at so that we bridge gaps, that there's not misunderstanding. It's easy to have a misunderstanding. Now, in verse 7, he says that when somebody is playing an instrument, that, they, that there should be understandability to it, that, that, that it should build somebody up. Now, if I were to pick up the flute, I don't play a wind instrument, uh, that would not inspire you. That would not, you would not draw closer to God. All it would do is irritate you, frustrate you, right? So he's saying, that's not helpful. You want to, you know, they need to know how to play. Oh, thank you. And then um, I'll take a sip. I was not feeling well. That's why I wasn't here last week. But Dreamer did a fantastic job. I enjoyed hearing her speak on the, um, on the web. Then he gives another analogy. He says, uh, he talks about this communication in military, like bugles and trumpets. And he says, uh, he says that just like in the, in the ancient days, really up until recent history, that bugles and trumpets were used in the military to communicate the commander's wishes, whether it was, and a certain sound was, was made so that they knew, oh, that's, you know, time to get up or time to uh, eat or Time to, you know, go to war. And he says, and so this is an appropriate analogy because that's what we're in. See, there's an enemy. There's a spiritual warfare that's going on. And, and with, we live in a, in a culture where the materialism and, 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 uh, and it would want to lull us into, a, into a, so, a somber where we're just going through life. We're not really aware of what's going on. And so really the worship leader is like that bugle caller saying, hey, there is a war at hand. And call, summons us out of our sleep, out of our slumber. It says, the, calls us to war. It says, hey, you, you need to be vigilant. You need to be aware of, of the schemes of the enemy. And so that's part of what worship happens. And that was discussed last week is, and, and part of Dream is Message, where that's part of what goes on in, in worship is, is this, this battle, you know, with, against this realizing that, that really life falls into two camps. You know, either the side of Christ or the side of the prince of darkness. And the prince of darkness tries to blind people and cause us to fall into that and, 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 and think that, <clears throat> that uh, there's no judgment that's impending, that people are not going to face a Christless eternity, that everything's really okay. And so worship is part of that call. Then there's a third analogy in verse 11. He says, if then I do not grasp the meaning of, of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker and he is a foreigner to me. It says, part of in public worship is we make sure that we don't have people that feel like they're outsiders. And that, that, that they know that they're included. <clears throat> if you were invited, if you're a child and you were invited to a dinner and you were, you, told, you were told you had to dress up and you had real uncomfortable clothing, your shirt didn't fit quite right and, and you go to somebody's house and, and then you're sitting in their formal area and the, and the the, uh, the seat is hard back and, 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 and it's all this gross food to you as a kid. You know, you don't, you've never seen most of it. It looks nasty. And, uh, and, and then they're speaking a mix of English and Hungarian. You don't really speak Hungarian. <clears throat> and then every once in a while they laugh and it's, you know, a joke and you don't get it. And then when they do speak English, they're talking about, you know, Aunt May and the trip they took down to the Rockies. And you're an outsider, right? Or... If, what if you were a kid and you were invited to a, to a dinner and you were allowed to dress in whatever you wanted and you were in a comfortable seat and they served food that mostly you had seen before. And if you didn't see a, a, piece, a, a certain meal, somebody was there to explain what it was and what it was made of. And they only spoke in the language that you knew and they didn't talk about uh, stories that you couldn't laugh and be part of and the jokes they did say you could laugh at. And, and which evening do you think you would enjoy more? We're the one where you are included, right? That's what Paul's saying here. When we do public worship, we need to make sure people feel included. 
We're not doing this mix of Hungarian and these kinds of things. And, and that there's explanations going on. And so when we talk about, when we think about worship, our, our worship experience, we, Paul says, that's something that we should be thinking about. And, and, and we do. That's something we think through. Verse 18, he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. In other words, don't shut people out. Don't, don't, people need to know that they're part of it. And then number four, the, the, fourth, uh, the fourth question is, does the worship reflect God's character? What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation or a tongue or interpretation. All these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or three uh, at most should speak at one time and somebody must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker must keep quiet in the church, uh, in the church, and speak to himself and not to and, and to speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes uh, to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And so here there's this balance he's talking about between vitality and excitement and the, all of these, this, this vibrancy and then also order and control and regulation. <clears throat> and both are important. Now, people, there's some people that when they go camping, they like to camp and they like to rough it. I mean, they go out and they, and they bring very little food with them. They have their water. And then when they run out of water, they have desalinization, you know, type of pills, iodine or whatever. And, and, uh, and, uh, and th then they have a little, a little spade to dig a dirt toilet, you know, and they don't have much food because they're going to eat off the land. And, and then other people, they like to go to a KOA. And uh, I've been to some KOAs where, I mean, you think you're camping, but really people are watching TV. They have the, the RV with the air conditioner on. And I mean, it's, it's, it's gravel pits. I mean, this. so you have like opposite ends. And, and worship is supposed to be neither of those. It's supposed to be more like a well-groomed garden. Just beautiful. Life everywhere, but organized. And well-groomed and well-administered. That's what public worship is. He's saying, this is the way it should be, where we want the presence of God. We want life and vibrancy and all of this, but it also has to have a certain amount of control to it. He says there, you know, at one point, God is really among you, but in verse 4, he says, be sure that everything is done properly and good and in an orderly fashion. And so we want both. We want both in our worship. Okay, so let me just close with this. When you're thinking of God, Part, and I think Mike was getting at it. What do you think of when you think of God? Do you see him as distant, far off? You're not really interacting with your problems, not really interacting with your life and the difficulties and the joys of your life? Or is he very close to you? Because if you're sensing, well, you know, God, I believe in him, but he's just far off. No wonder you're not sensing him in worship. No wonder when during worship you're like this, you know, or on your phone, just kind of, you know, I mean, just, you're just kind of going through the motions because God our view of God really is a projection, is, is lived out through when we worship, when we're called to worship, when the bugler says, this is the moment we're going in to this expression of our belief of God. And songs are really just, uh, worship is really just that, okay? Let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll, we'll, do, some, we'll do some worship, okay? Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, and invite you into this place right now. I know you're always here, but we invite you in where you're not just over there. You're here. You're here. So that we sense surely God is in this place. And Lord, we just, we don't want to just be concerned with our own liberty and freedom, but we also want to build people up through everything that we do that make you accessible and relevant and understandable. So Lord, teach us what it means to worship. Teach us what it means to follow you and to respond in a way that, that would uh, be consistent with our true belief, with our beliefs about you and how we feel about you. In Jesus' name, amen.